gospel and turn to the book of Mark, chapter number 8. Mark in chapter number 8. I like that. That was good singing. I like that. Mark in chapter number 8. I look forward to that day when Jesus does come. Amen. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. I look forward to not having to live by faith anymore. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. But there's coming a day, the scripture says, when we shall see him as he is. Won't have to take it by faith. You'll be able to touch him and see him and hear him and know him. And uh, man, what a great day that will be. Mark in chapter number 8, a little bit of a different maybe Sunday morning than I would uh, message and I would normally preach on a Sunday morning. Um, I almost wish this was one of those messages where I could maybe have you come over and, and uh, I was trying to say put on a pot of coffee, but we don't do that anymore. We use the Keurig. Uh, but uh, maybe put those little cups in there and make you a cup of coffee and put you a little creamer in there, a little dash of cinnamon, and uh, a little uh, the cinnamon will be fine. And... Uh, <coughs> And uh, just make me make you, make you get you a little Danish or something. Let you sit down at the kitchen table. Let me talk to you a little bit about the Christian life. I can't do that, but if you'll this morning humor me a little bit and let this pulpit be that kitchen table, and you where you are and I where I am, let me speak to you this morning a little bit to help you with your Christian life. And and I think if you'll listen to me, I think if you'll take notes, if if you'll if you'll jot down some things and then process what I'm saying. I truly believe that what I'm going to share with you this morning will help you in your Christian life uh, for sure now, but it will help you uh, down the road, certainly. Mark in chapter number 8, and uh, uh, let me simply just read uh, one verse in Mark chapter number 8, verse number uh, 27. Actually, I'm going to read just a couple verses and then pray. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. That's a good, cho that's a good choice, but it's incorrect. And some say Elias, uh, Elijah. It's a good one, but that's incorrect. And others, one of the prophets, maybe Jeremiah resurrected, or Isaiah, or Zechariah. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter. Now, if you have a pen, will you underline the name Peter, please? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. He got it right. He didn't just get it right. He got it 100% right. Now, who was it that got it right? It was Peter. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help me this morning, empower me to say the things I should say, nothing that I should not. Dear Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, whether they're here present or listening online, I pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit would save their, them before it's everlastingly too late. But particularly this morning, Father, I feel a burden for the Christians, me, and use the word of God to help us all to draw a little bit closer to our Lord and Savior. Father, be with us, empower us this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Now I want you to look at your Bible, and we're going to do a little bit of a Bible study. This morning the message is not so much based off of a text, as it is based off of a pattern. And I need you to see the pattern. If you don't see the pattern, you're not really going to understand the message. A lot of times when you're preaching, almost every time when you're preaching, you're looking right at a text or a narrative, but you're looking at that text and building what you say. This morning, I'm building around a pattern. I need you to see the pattern. Look, if you will, at verse number 29. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And who was it who responded to him? Say it out loud. Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. Bingo, you get the gold star, you get the candy bar. Brother, you got the answer of all answers, and I'm not preaching on this, but let it be unashamedly, unabashedly declared that Jesus is the Son of the living God. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the foundation of all that we believe. You got it, Peter, you nailed it. Amen. Verse number 30, And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders, chief priests, scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake, and he spake that saying openly, and who? What's the name? Peter. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now you just said you're the Christ. Now you're going to rebuke the guy? And notice now, if you were to look at the text in Matthew, Jesus was really proud of Matthew. 
said you did a great job, wonderful. Now, now watch what he says here, verse number 33. But when he turned about to him, Jesus looked on his disciples. He rebuked Peter, Peter saying, get thee behind me. Ouch. So one minute, Peter's going, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, amen. The next minute, Jesus is looking at him going, shut up, devil. Wow. All right. So look at chapter number nine now, if you will. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some, chapter 9, verse 1, some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they see the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him whom? Peter. Peter, James, and John. That's pretty cool, man. You're in a real select group now. There were more than just 12 disciples. There were 70. At one time, there were close to four or 5,000 that were following Jesus. That narrowed down to 70, and then there were 12. He was one of the big three. I like that. He says, you're going to get to go with me up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and you're going to get to see what no other living man has seen until Jesus comes back again, and that is Jesus, the Son of God, in all his power and glory. Look at verse 2. He leadeth them up into a high mountain apart from them, and he was apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So Peter gets hand-selected to go up there. Really cool. And then he opens his mouth. Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. There's only one person that should have been worshipped in that group, and that was Jesus. Notice... Verse number six, for he wist not what to say. That's usually the way we are. When we don't know what to say, instead of being quiet, we say stupid. Amen, Amen right? And notice the Bible says, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. So now he's so far off the mark that God Almighty himself has to say, shut up. Right? Okay. Verse number 12. He begins to ask questions. Verse number 11. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must come first? Now, that might not seem like an important point to you, but that was very important in Jewish theology because it was very clearly taught in Malachi and Isaiah that before the Messiah would come, paving the way would be Elias. Now, Jesus said unto them, verse 12, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said it not. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come. In other words, what he was saying was is that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the spirit of Elijah. He's giving them revelation that the other disciples didn't know. Really cool stuff. And they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. That's really, really cool. They were the only three that got that pure revelation. I mean, that is really, you're at the pinnacle now. You've got Jesus teaching you one-on-one -on, -one on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's really cool. We jump forward just a little bit. Look at chapter number 9, verse number 30. And they departed thence in chapter 9, verse 30, and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered in the hands of men. They shall kill him. After he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were sore afraid. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? Jesus was walking in front of them, or maybe even behind them, but Jesus could hear them murmuring and complaining back and forth and talking. And when they got to Capernaum, he said, Hey, what, what were you guys so heated argument about? And notice in verse number 34, but they held their peace. They didn't answer him. Now, this is the group that will answer Jesus at the drop of a hat. All of a sudden, they go real quiet. Why is that? Well, verse 34, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Now, I'll give you one guess, and it's not told us here. I could be wrong, but I'm not. I'll give you one guess who it was who was leading the charge of who was going to be the greatest. I suspect it's Peter. And I think I have Bible for that because later on down the line when Jesus said, all men shall reject me this night, Peter said, though all these reject thee, 
I never will. See, I'm the best. Amen? <laughs> Listen, Lord, you can't trust Thomas. And Matthew's a tax collector. You know you can't trust him. And I've always thought John and James were a little outside. You can count on me. And I suspect walking down the road, Peter was reminding them as they were debating back and forth, well, you know, I think I'm doing pretty good. I think Peter said, excuse me, fellas, I just want to remind you, I'm the only one who got it right when he asked that question back in chapter 8. You guys said John the Baptist and Elias, but I'm the one that got it right, so line up behind me. You may make it into heaven, but you'll make it in my wake. <laughs> I mean, that's just Peter, right? Now, I want you to see the pattern here. Look back at chapter number 8. 29, chapter number 8, verse 29 Thou art the Christ. That's pretty good. You're way up here. Uh, verse number 33, get behind me, Satan. Oh, and you're way down here. Jesus said now in chapter number 9, look at chapter number 9. Hey, Peter, come on, man. We're going up. You're going to get to see something that nobody else gets to see. Way up here. And then God has to say from the cloud, hey, man, will you shut up? You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, way down here. Then they're coming off the mountain, and God, Jesus himself is teaching them, and the light is coming on for Peter, and he's like, ding, 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 I'm getting this whole thing. It makes sense. Way the way back up here. And then he's walking by the way, and Jesus said, what were you discussing? Oh, who is going to be the greatest? Hmm? Then if you were to follow the pattern all the way through, there you've got Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. When everybody's running away, Peter pulls a sword, ready to defend Jesus Christ against the mob that's coming at him. Wow, that's cool. And then a little girl who minds the door of the temple said, don't I remember you? Weren't you one of his disciples? And he denies him. That is a roller coaster Christian. And that is what you and I, if we're honest, find ourselves doing a lot. My message this morning is for you roller coasters. All of us, to some degree or another, are like that. Man, doing good. And then, man, I got my Bible reading. Hadn't prayed in six months, but I'm reading my Bible. Well, you get your prayer going. When was the last time you read your Bible? Bible what? You just about your time you get one sin buttoned up, something over here. Get that one taken care of, that one creeps back. Marriage is going great. Children are demon possessed. Children are obeying. My wife is hitting me with a frying pan. Church is going great. Work is horrible. Work is great. The pastor stinks. It, it, it just yes or no, am I the only one or is that not feel like that sometimes? The dangerous part about that is, is you get tired of it, and then so you say, you know what, I'm just not going to get on the ride anymore. Whew, and that's the dangerous part. Amen. Then you're just not even on. But I think as Christians, if we're honest, there is a lot more truth to that than we realize. Roller coaster. How many times have I preached, or a preacher has preached something, and you hear it, and conviction comes to you, that's what I'm going to start doing. And you do for like 48 hours. Say amen. It's a struggle. And we, we tend to have that pattern like Peter in our life. Well, this morning, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is there is probably not ever going to stop that roller coaster in your life until you get to heaven. But the good news is you can mitigate the highs and lows a bit. You're probably going to be struggling with that to some degree or another. I always am weary of preachers who preach as if they've got the world by the tail. That always bothers me a little bit because you're the same chunk of dirt that I am and we struggle. But what I am saying is that there are truths in the word of God that can keep you from having to go from way up here to boom, way down here and then back again. You can modulate that a little bit. It's like driving. Have you ever seen a new driver their corrections are so big, right? Yeah, so get back over it. You're still making corrections. Nobody gets in the car and holds the wheel straight, or they shouldn't, right? right? And if you drive older cars like I do, then you know you, you can't hold it straight because it's, for some reason it's out of line. It's got that slight lean to some direction. Give me an amen on that. 
So you know you got to get it lined up, and you, but you're making correct. No, 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 no. A, 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 a superior driver, a mature driver, is still making corrections, but they're making them smaller. They're catching it before it goes off the ditch. No, no, I'm going to keep it here. And yes, I'm correcting, and yes, I'm correcting. That immature driver is making those big swings, but a mature Christian is one who goes, yeah, I'm still going to have that. I'm still going to have to make corrections, but I don't have to wait until I'm in the ditch. I don't have to wait until I've hit a telephone pole. I don't have to wait until I had a head-on collision to put the pieces back together. There are truths in the Bible that can keep you modulated, and you don't have to be Peter here. You can head down the road in maturity. Does that make sense this morning? Grab a pen and paper. Let me give you a couple thoughts. I don't care where you're writing. Write them in the back of your Bible. Write them in the front. Write them on a tithe envelope as long as you put money in it afterwards. I don't care where you write on it, but let me give you several points very, very quickly. Number one, I've already said this, but I want to develop it just a moment. All believers struggle with the old versus the new nature. Now, that, that, to some of you, that's probably, oh, yeah, preacher, I get that. But no, 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 no. I want you to sink it in, especially you older Christians. All believers struggle with the old versus the new nature. It is an ongoing struggle that will continue throughout your Christian life. There is always, always, always going to be a struggle with that old nature. Hold your place, if you will, and, and turn with me to the book of Romans in chapter number 7. Romans in chapter number 7. Now, each point builds upon another, so I don't want you to sit down and camp out on one thought but I do want you to get this point that the old and the new, there's always going to be that struggle. I'm not saying you can't have victory, but I'm saying if you think you're going to reach a plane of enlightenment or nirvana or spiritual Shangri-La to where you have arrived and it's just not there, you are fooling yourself. Paul said in Romans chapter number 7, verse number 15, for that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I. Now, there's not any Christian in this room that couldn't give a good hearty amen to that. Right. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now watch verse 18 very closely. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. My will is not the problem. I want to do what God wants me to do, he's saying. The problem is how to make myself do it. The will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. Notice verse number 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. When you got saved, you received a new nature from God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You got a new desire, you got a new hunger, you want to read your Bible. And let me just say something to the young people in this room. That is not exclusively for people that are older and don't have anything better to do than to walk around trying to be cool. If you're here this morning and you're saved, I don't care whether you're 11 or 12 or 22 or 82, you should have a hunger for the Word of God, a hunger for prayer. You should like and want to come to church. You should have the same desires that any other adult Christian has. If you're old enough to be saved, you're old enough to bear the fruit of salvation. Be careful about that. So when you got saved, you got that new life, that new heart, that new desire, but the old didn't go away. There's now a wrestling that goes in there. There's now a, a, a battle. And one of the first things where that crops up is your language. Do you remember some of you before you saved, the language you used to use? Yeah. One of the first things that happens when you get saved, you can't use that same language anymore. Boy, before you got saved, it didn't bother you a bit, man. You just let it go, and then all of a sudden, you why? There's a new nature, the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's a battle going on. Now, I want you to listen to me very closely. As you get saved, very early on, everything becomes surface. Don't do this and don't do that and don't drink that and don't smoke that and don't wear that and don't go there. And you must do this and you must read that and you must attend here. And, and, and it's surface and it has its rhyme and its reason for that. But you have to understand that the real battle, the real struggle goes far deeper than do's and don'ts. The real struggle in your Christian life, and listen to me now, Christian, the reason that you find yourself sometimes on that, that, that roller coaster up and down is because it's not so much a battle of do's and don'ts, it's a battle of self or savior. 
That's the big one. That is why some Christians can sit in a pew, read their Bible, pray, do a lot of great things, and yet there's still something sour about them when you scratch below the surface. Let something not go their way. Let, let a vote go different. Let them not get appointed to a committee. Let the preacher do something that they don't like or they don't approve of. Let somebody sit in there and say, let something scratch below the surface. And all of a sudden, you've got discord and ugliness. And, and you think, where in the world did that come from? Why, they've been in church 30 years. They may have. They may have all their do's and don'ts down. But they never really dealt with the main issue of self versus Savior. You can be just as selfish and ugly and carnal a Christian sitting in the pew of a Baptist church as you can sitting at a bar. And if you don't believe that, you haven't been to a Baptist business meeting. You haven't been around church very long. Some of the meanest ugliest, most vicious things that have ever been said about other people come from the mouths of Bible-believing, Bible-toting, hymn-singing believers. Wear their hair just right, their dress just long enough, their tie just tight enough. Outwardly, everything is there, but they never dealt with the issue of self and Savior. It is not about what? Look back at Mark real quick. That's why tucked in there is that famous passage, Mark chapter number 8. Mark in chapter number 8, notice what it says in verse number 34, Mark 8, 34. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also he said to them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Would you take your pen and underline the word there, himself, and then underline me? Do, do you see that he didn't say deny what? He didn't tell them to deny a thing. He told them to deny self. That's the reason why so much preaching goes unheeded. It's because behind the what that you are doing or the what that you're not doing is the self that wants it that way. You parent the way you want, regardless of what kind of teaching the preacher does. You are a husband or mother the way you want, regardless of how much teaching goes in. The issue is not the what. The issue is the self. That's why there are some people, now, now, now let me give you, don't get freaky now. Don't get all, oh my gosh, pastor preaches in Sarasota one time and he comes back a liberal. I knew those people were mad down there. <laughs> That's why there's going to be some King James only believers that have to line up behind non-King James only when they're standing in front of Christ. They were never really taught. They never understood. They were never given the light that you and I have been given the light about the word of God. But they did understand, I need to live for God. I need to do what's right. I need to live the Bible. Right. And they were living Christianity even though they didn't understand all the ins and outs. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not near as concerned, though I am concerned about the word of God. I'm not near as concerned at what you're carrying. I'm near as concerned about what it's doing in your heart. Yeah. And so... What I'm saying is, is that all believers have that struggle between the old and the new, and the struggle is between what you want versus surrendering that to the Lord and saying, Lord, not my will be done, but thine. Make sense? Long before you just pat yourself on the back, you have to search your heart and say, what's the real struggle? It's between self and Jesus. Who's going to sit on the throne? Number two, very quickly, will you write this down? And it really is a development on top of what I just said. Outward conformity can hide inward flaws and emptiness. Outward conformity can hide inward flaws and emptiness. Look at, at Mark chapter number 14 and, and notice what Peter said. I'm sorry, in Mark chapter number 8. He said to him, thou art the Christ. He was behind him 100%. But I want you to turn over real quick now to Mark in chapter number 14, and I want you to see this in, in Mark 14. 
Look at Mark in chapter number 14 and notice Peter here. And you're going to watch this real closely now. Look at Mark chapter 14 and notice what the Bible says in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. I won't. Now I want you to look way down in verse number 37. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto them, saith unto who? Peter. Peter. Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Wait a second, Peter, you just told me a little while ago that you were going to stand with me, and you can't even pray one hour? Your mouth is big, but you're not able to fulfill it. And notice what the next verse says. Boy, this, this strikes all of us. Watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak in it. Be very, very careful about outward conformity. Saying the right things, looking the right way, but there's nothing there. Listen to me very closely. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. It's going to be hard for you to hear, harder for me to say, but you need to know this. A pastor pastors for a length of time, builds relationships with people, friendships with people. You know me and I know you and you know my flaws and I know yours and we rub shoulders together and our kids grow up together and we, do, we, we, we spend a lot of time. But you understand something. Before friendship, before anything else, a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a preacher and a teacher. Paul said, warning every man and teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. And when you hear something come across this pulpit, if I tell you I like a Ford truck better than a Chevy, that's my opinion. If I tell you I like a 45 caliber better than a 9 millimeter, that's my opinion. If I tell you that I like, uh, I like bears more than I do lions, that's my opinion. But if I open up the word of God and teach and preach to you out of the word of God, Dear friend, that's not my opinion, that's not my personality, and that's not my preference. That's the words of God mediated through the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility to hear it and to apply it. Amen. To apply it to your life. You can't just sit in church and hear and hear and hear and hear and hear and not do it. You got to do it. Right. You, you, can't, uh, you can't do that, ladies and gentlemen. I think a lot of times we sit in church, but we are comfortable without ever being changed. We pray, but we're comfortable without any victory. We read our Bible, but we're comfortable without actually seeing the power of the living Jesus Christ through the Word of God. In other words, if you're not careful, we become very, very uh, uh, complacent without having a living God. Now, please hear what I'm saying on this Labor Day weekend. We do not serve a dead, dry dogma. God is real. And I'm not a charismatic. I don't believe in any warm, tingly spine, all that experiences. I'm not talking about that at all. But I believe in a living, powerful God. And brother, if you don't have that experience, if God's not real to you, if you're not in a living, vibrant relationship, don't settle for being outwardly conformed. Take your Bible real quick. Turn to Psalms chapter 42. I, I want you to see this. I suppose never a man in Scripture longed after God any more than David. Now that was a secret. He longed for God. Was he perfect? No. By any stretch of the imagination. But he longed for the living God. That's what I long for. Not perfectly. And there are times at any time in any Christian's life Remember that roller coaster when you're going to just kind of go through it. But, beloved, you shouldn't let yourself go through a dry period very long before you start doing some praying and some crying and say, God, be real to me. Yeah. We're so afraid of the charismatic. We're so afraid of, of that wild-eyed radicalism that we have exchanged the reality of a living God. You get into the parking lot of the average church today and watch them leave and watch their life. Their life is just as dry as it can be. That's why church today has to have so much entertainment, something to give us a fix. Man, I don't want entertainment from the preacher. I don't want entertainment from the music. 
I don't want entertainment from the programs. I want the presence of a living God in my life. Amen. And notice what David said in Psalm 42, verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. You ever thirst for God? And some of you this morning, that emptiness, or rather that feeling if you've never been addicted to anything, you don't know what that feeling's like. But if you've ever had an addiction of any sort, you know what that feeling is like when you want that fix for that addiction, but you can't get it. You get fidgety. You get nervous a little bit. There's a, a gnawing. It feels like a little bit of a gnawing inside. You're not satisfied with anything. You're worried. Why? Because you're craving something. You're craving that fix. That's a shame. That's not what we want physically. But that should be the way that our soul is when it comes to God. When God's not around or you have maybe drifted just a little bit away, you start getting, getting fidgety a little bit, dry a little bit. Nothing. Why? I, I, I need to be in the presence of God. I need a living God. Not words on a page. Not a list of do's and don'ts. I need God that satisfies the soul deeper than any man could satisfy. Yeah. As the heart. Notice my soul, verse 2, thirsteth for God, for the living God. I submit to you this morning, I submit to you this morning, that no amount of building size and no amount of programs can substitute for the presence of a living God. I believe with all of my heart that that's what's missing in the average Christian in America today. We have the cars, we have the homes, we have the vacations, we have the pleasure, we have all of the good things of this life, but where is the living God in our churches? Where is the living God in our homes? Where is the living God in our lives? When's the last time you felt fidgety for God? When's the last time you felt uncomfortable? Not because you had to have God just meet a big need, because you just felt, Lord, I just don't feel close to you. Lord, I, I want you to be here with me. I'm not talking about some light or some aura. I'm talking about something that touches your soul. I'm talking about the living God. Amen. When's the last time you were fidgety for that? I think most Christians are more fidgety for chocolate than they are for God. Notice what it says, verse 4. When I remember these things, what do I do? I pour out my soul in me. Verse 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his distant love, of his countenance, of his countenance. Beloved, one of the things that will keep you from that roller coaster is not being satisfied with outward conformity. Yes, Lord, I've checked the box this week. I haven't robbed any stores. I haven't murdered any people. I haven't plundered. I haven't raped. I haven't pillaged. I haven't smoked crack. I, I, I read a little bit of my Bible. I, I did my daily bread. I said my prayers. I'm good. No, sir. No, sir. That's not enough. If you're reading your Bible and you're praying and you're not getting at the heart of God every once in a while, you're doing it wrong. It isn't dry words on a page. It's a living God that fills your soul. That's what revival is. <clears throat> revival is the manifest presence of God. You can go out here and say, hey, we're going to have a 10-day revival. Just because you have music and bring in evangelists, that doesn't bring revival. Right. I'm asking you something, Christian, and I'm camping out on this because I think the Holy Spirit... It's punching some of your buttons, right. mine included. Can I ask you something without, and you misunderstand me, if you, if you misunderstood me, then you just go right on ahead. When's the last time you felt God in your life? I hear people say all the time, oh, well, that's a God thing, that's a God thing, that's a God thing. This, no, 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 when's the last time you prayed and felt God Almighty's countenance in your presence? When's the last time you read that Bible and you got down and you couldn't even hardly read two or three verses before you felt, boom, the Holy Spirit of God 
move in on you and say, look at that verse right there. And you knew that God Almighty was reading that book over your shoulder with you. When's the last time you felt that? When's the last time you walked into the service on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night and you thought, man, something going on in here, man. Something going on in here. I don't know, it ain't the music, it ain't the preacher, something's going on in here. What is it? It's God. Now you and I can't live by that experience. You can't live by that experience. But you ought to be able to have that every once in a while. Come in. You can't, listen, I, I hurt myself so bad the other night. We did tacos. Friday night, taco night. I'm not going to tell you how many tacos I had because I believe in Christian liberty and you shouldn't be legalistic in judgment. <laughs> but I helped myself. My wife said I got, uh, she got some of these. They got these taco things now. I don't know if you've seen them. But they, they look like, they look like they're, they're bowls. Have you seen the little, if you know what I'm talking about, give me an amen. amen. They're little bowls. Man, that, see, the old tacos, they, they helped you a little bit because you can only fit so much in there before they break. Give me an amen there. <laughs> these new ones are like a little tugboat. Man, you pile that stuff up high in there, man. I can't live on tacos every single night. We've got to have the, the white fish, and we've got to have the pasta with, with uh, uh, vegetables in there. we got to, I understand that. You've got to eat right. But every once in a while, it's good to have a taco night. Every once in a while, it's good to sit over there in the recliner and have your belly gorged out with those tacos. Say, hey, amen. That was good stuff right there. Say, amen. Amen. And I know that we walk by faith. I know that it's not always bells and whistles. I understand that God doesn't all the time bring those kind of things. But every once in a while, my Bible says that we serve a living God. He's alive. He's real. He's living. And every once in a while, there's nothing wrong with God Almighty throwing you a little taco night over there, a little token from the Lord. When's the last time you had that? Well, preacher, I read through my Bible last year. Well, what did he do? Did you get any closer to God? Is your marriage any better? Is your heart any tender, more tender? Or are you just as bitter and sour as you were the year before? God deliver me from Christians that check the list and go on about their business. No closer to God. No closer to their fellow man. No closer to heaven whatsoever. Brother, I'd rather have somebody that reads and plows and maybe gets a verse here, a verse there, but they long, they hunger, they thirst for God. God, touch my soul. God, touch my heart. God, be real to me. Amen. So I just don't feel that way. Then get saved. Amen. But if you're a Christian, you know what I'm saying is true. Your heart echoes that. You can't live off of that, but every once in a while, God, send me some tacos. The average Baptist church, the average Christian church has substituted everything for God. And I'm here to tell you, I'll tell you without, without one single doubt in my mind, that's one of the greatest plagues of our churches today. You take the music programs away, you take the lighting and the screens and the padded pews, and you take all of the bells and whistles away from the church, they'd have to close doors because people aren't going looking for God, they're going looking for a religious fix for themselves. Well, I do thank God for the padded pews. I do thank God for the AC and the music and all the rest. But brother, when I come to church, when I come to the Bible, I'm not looking for bells and whistles. I'm looking for God Almighty. That's what I'm looking for. My soul thirsts for God. And brother, we're living in a day when it's a dry land. Well, brother, I want God. And just because you check your boxes off doesn't mean that you've touched the heart of God. Right. You men, you women, find your place. Go for a walk. Get alone. Don't be afraid. God's not going to get mad at you. Tell him, Lord, I've been eating these vegetables a while now. <laughs> and if you see fit, next time I open that Bible... If you see fit to, to give me some Brussels sprouts, I'll eat it. Lord, I don't want to, but if you hit me with a zucchini boat, I'll eat it. But Lord, I sure could use a soft taco. A little bit of cheddar cheese on that thing. Some sour cream. I don't even need the lettuce, Lord. Don't even need a tomato. Just a double helping of sour cream and cheddar cheese and some spicy salsa. Lord, I need a taco. 
I remember that. I was down a couple years ago, down, discouraged, going through a battle, going through a struggle. Down there in, in Honduras, we landed, and, and my luggage was taken. The lady took it by mistake, thought it was mine, went up three hours into the mountains, wasn't going to come back for two days. And I'll never forget, literally, the only thing I had were the clothes on my back, and they were, I had to preach the next day. And uh, I remember just feeling down and discouraged. And Brother Gio had given me his shirt, which was like two sizes too small. <laughs> and Brother Rich had given me a pair of pants, just kind of bumming around pants, real old. That he, they were old and they were real baggy, and so they were really baggy. I looked like some sort of weevil wobble, a skinny shirt, <laughs> uh, baggy pants, a tie. Brother, I think Brother, Brother Paul had given me a tie, and it didn't match, but it was just there it was, you know? Because you can't preach without a tie and be right with God. You know that, right? Oh, man, I felt so bad. I remember getting up, reading the book of Psalms, reading the book of Proverbs, trying to find something. And, and man, I was taking, I was learning my lesson. Man, the Lord was chasing me. I was learning my lesson. But I just kind of felt discouraged. And I, this isn't going to mean a whole lot to you, but at the time, it was a real help to me. I was reading down there through the book of Proverbs. And over in the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, a poor man is better than a liar. I just, I've read through that thing a thousand times. Never had done anything. I'd read through that just proverb after proverb after proverb, eating my veggies like God wants me to. But on that particular morning, on the side of that hill in Honduras, God told the angel, he said, send that boy some tacos. Now he's had enough of all this health food. Send him a taco down there. And I was up on that balcony early in the morning. I read that, and I felt like, you know what? That's right. I might be a poor man. I might have a skinny shirt on. I might have baggy pants on. I might look like an idiot in a weeble wobble. But a poor man is better than a liar. I got the right gospel. I got the right Bible. I got the right Savior. I'm not a poor man. I'm a, not a liar. Man, God gave me a little taco there. Don't you settle for a casual, unburdened. Something from God in a while, start asking. God, give me something. Give me something, God. Give me something, God. I think God likes that. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. Now let me hurry. I've got to get to these other points. Number three, real growth and maturity exposes the deeper issues of our life exposes the deeper issues of our life. Now you be careful about asking God to give you something deeper because the doorway through which he brings that taco is on the platter of humility. The reason I got that taco on the side of the mountain there with God is because I look like a weeble wobble. Wee wee wobble. I, I, I was at a humble point in my life. And God will serve you that taco, but it'll do it on the plate of humility. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Job. Everybody still with me, yes or no? Job in chapter number 42. You go running out of here, well, I like the way the preacher hits that pulpit and jump. I'm going to go get God to give me taco, okay? But first, he's going to cram a dose of humility down your throat that you and I both need. That's, that's what makes that thing taste so good. Notice Job in chapter number 42. Notice what the scripture says in Job 42, verse number 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Now mine eye seeth thee. I heard about you all my life, God. But now I see you. Notice, wherefore I abhor myself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You know one of the reasons why we can't deny ourselves? Because we don't abhor ourselves, We really love that person in the mirror. No, sir, preacher, if you knew how negative I was to myself, you might be negative, but you love yourself. Satan said, yay, skin for skin, all that a man hath 
willingly give for himself. Satan knows the human heart. God knows the human heart. And the truth of the matter is it's very, very hard for us to abhor. We like to cherish a little bit of self-righteousness. The question is this morning, what do you love more than God? Absolutely nothing, preacher. Then you don't know yourself very well. But you don't get the taco unless it's served on a plate of humility. Real growth and maturity is going to expose the deeper issues of your life. Now let me say this and I'll move on. That is why sometimes God does not allow us to get out of trials. And I'm going to say something here and you need to hear me now. I'm treading on a very a, a delicate ground, but you've got to hear this. That's also why God does not sometimes immediately deliver you from sin. How many in this room have prayed? Don't raise your hand. Don't owe me. Don't. God, help me overcome this sin. And you feel like he does it. Sometimes the Lord doesn't immediately help. You know why? Because you don't really want the deliverance and it could be another sin plugged right in there. You have to come to a point where you abhor yourself. Sin becomes exceedingly sinful. It's not just I shouldn't do that. It's not just I feel guilty for doing that. No. It is a hatred of that sin. It is a hatred of the self that wants that sin. And sometimes God doesn't immediately rush in to help. He's got to, he does, God doesn't do toxic charity. He's got to let you get to that point to where you really see what you are. The problem is not the sin. The problem goes back to that first point. It's the self. Number four, very quickly write this down. Spiritual faith and victory. Watch it now. Spiritual victory comes by faith in him, not faith in our faith. Let me say that to you again. Spiritual victory comes by faith in him, not by faith in our faith. You wake up one day and you feel like, I'm on top of the world spiritually. Wonderful. What happens the next day when you wake up and you're not? Where does the victory come? By faith in him. Looking to him. Trusting in him. Trusting in him. When you got saved, what did you do to get yourself saved? Grab your Bible real quick and turn to the book of Colossians. Colossians in chapter number 2. Let me show you this. When you got saved, you came by faith. By faith, trusting in him. Not a feeling. You came by faith, trusting in him. Now notice what the scripture says in Colossians in chapter number 2. Notice what scripture says in verse number 6. Very simple but yet true. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You weren't looking to yourself as the source of strength. You believed that Christ died for your sins, rose again the third day, was seated at the right hand. You knew that you were a sinner and helpless. I'm trusting in you to help me. That same faith never changes. It shouldn't. But there's a gear that comes into our mind that says, okay, now that I'm saved, now switch gears and you run over here and try to make all of this work. No, sir. I'm not saying you shouldn't read your Bible or shouldn't stop sin, but what I'm saying is every day of your life, that same saving faith, that same essence where you said, I can't do it, Lord Jesus, I, I, I lift my eyes to you, that's the same sanctifying faith. Not just a verbal, not just a frustration sitting in a red light when everything is, is crashing around. Lord, I just, you know, like that stupid song that country singer sang years ago, uh, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Shut up. Don't even know what you're talking about. Say me to go home. You know that's true. She doesn't even know what she's talking about, making a million bucks off of some sort of stupid, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a conscious, intentional, morning-by-morning morning faith that says, I'm trusting in you, Lord. I'm a sinner, and I, I need growth in this area. Will you help me? Being confident in this very thing, Philippians says, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, I need you to help me. Lord, I need you to help me. I need you, Lord. Strengthen me. Guide me. Work with me. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's chastening. Sometimes that's plowing through some stuff. But it, your faith is not in your faith. Your faith is in Jesus Christ. So my last point is this. The essence of walking with God, and here it is, response of the soul to what Christ wants. Let me say it again. The essence of growth is responding to God when he begins to deal with you on something. I mean responding in such a way that everything else fades out. You say what you want to say about Peter, but he responded when others wouldn't. When Jesus was walking on the water, you can make fun of him all you want. But while the others sat back and watched, Peter responded. There was something in his heart that had a response to God. Beloved, that's what God is looking for through the preaching and through the word. He is looking for us to respond to him, to respond to that prompting. It is indifference that God cannot abide. I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because thou art lukewarm. Now when I say lukewarmness, every Christian in this room who's been saved for a while immediately thinks of some compromising, non-King James caring, praise and worship, latte drinking Christianity. I'm telling you this morning, as your shepherd, you can be lukewarm cooking a Wednesday night supper. You can be lukewarm working the nursery. You can be lukewarm doing the dishes after a big get-together. You can be lukewarm playing the piano or preaching the word of God or teaching the Sunday school. Lukewarm is not about what you're carrying and what you're dressing like. It's a condition of the heart. It's a condition of the heart that has gotten comfortable at whatever level that you're at, that you're, that you're on. I'm good. I, I'm fine. Life is good. Got a little money in the bank. The job's going well. Preaching seems to be okay. You haven't stepped on my two toes too much until today. Everything is doing fine. We're good. I'm fine where I am. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. You're lukewarm. There's something in your soul. Something. In your soul, every once in a while, the Holy Spirit reaches over there and starts to pick out a little bit and says, I want that. Lord, help yourself to anything in the living room. No, 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 no. I want what's in that secret chamber that you have in your bedroom, in your closet, in the safe, hidden in the wall that you don't think anybody knows about. That's what I want. And you don't let him have it? You're not responding to God, you're lukewarm. Preacher, I carry a King James Bible. Amen. I, I know the hymns. Amen. But are you responding to God? When the Holy Spirit begins to convict you, Christian, I ask you this morning, I'm not asking you to say anything out loud. But what has the Holy Spirit within the last six months, last three months, last month, what have you been convicted about that needs to change in your personal life? What has con been convicted about in your behavior, in your language, in your priorities, in your relationship? What have you been convicted about but you just kind of put it on the back burner and I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. 10,000 times no, sir. You're better off to attempt and fail because all that does is make you a just man. The Bible says the just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Doesn't say he might fall, says he will fall. If you go out of here and the Holy Spirit's working on you about something, good news, bad news. Good news is he's gonna help you. Bad news is you're gonna bust your can a lot before you get victory over that thing. Same in on that, you know that's true. It's gonna happen. But you're better off jumping out of the boat and trying to walk with Jesus. I'd rather be drowning with Jesus than in the boat with the disciples doing nothing. Respond to him. God's convicting you about something in your marriage. Young man, if God's convicting you about something that you're looking at on your phone, 
Man, if God's convicting you about something in your soul, senior Christian, if God's convicting you about an attitude that you're having, whatever it is, respond to God. God, I'm not much, and I know I'm going to fail you. And listen, there's times I almost feel embarrassed about praying to the Lord about something because I know as I'm praying, I'm probably going to do it when I'm through praying. Lord, I am what I am. I'm trying. But Father, you're not going to get me sitting on the pew, listening to the message, nodding my head, going, that's pretty good, and it leaving my heart and soul by the time I cross the barrier of the church property. God, you're going to get a man, you're going to get a woman that will respond to you, and if you say go left, I'm going left. If you say go right, I'm going right. If you say stop, I'm stopping. If you say start, I'll start. Hut, whatever you say, whatever you do, whatever you want, I'm going to fail you. I'm telling you now, Lord, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to fail you. I know I am. But I'm going to give you everything I got. Amen. I'm going to respond to you. Lord, Holy Spirit looks over there and says, that's what I want. That's what I want. Just respond. seen marriages before, counseled marriages before, in the church and out of the church. I've seen people in my office that literally I thought, we're going to have a fist fight. <laughs> and with our women around here, it isn't fist, it's probably a knife or a gun. I mean, it's, <laughs> man. I've had people before, not members of this church, but I had a couple before that just, <laughs> cuss words I didn't even know existed. Ways to organize those cuss words. I didn't even know you could do that in a grammatical sentence, and yet they made it happen. I've seen people come back from that more times than you think. I can tell you when somebody walks in the door as a married couple, I can usually tell, especially outside, you'd be surprised how much outside counseling a preacher does. I can tell you usually within three to five minutes whether there's hope or not. And it's always this. Do they respond? Right. Now, now you, let, you let them sit down. Well, she just, you know, I, she just mean when he just. <laughs> All right, we can work on that. And then you got the, the newlyweds, you know, the newly in love. Oh, you're sweet. Oh, you know, I love you. That makes you want to vomit. <laughs> Come in. That's when you know, though, that there's real trouble. When they don't even have the energy or the wherewithal to fight one another anymore. They don't even want to respond. You might as well go ahead and call the lawyer. You don't need a preacher, you need a lawyer. Because you're just living together as roommates. You've stopped responding. Beloved, is there something in your life that God is calling you on? I showed you the pattern of a man who one minute is at the pinnacle of Christian success. The next minute, Jesus is calling him Satan. One minute, he's on the mountain of transfiguration. The next minute, he's walking with the disciples worried about who's going to be the best. One minute, he's willing to defend Jesus Christ. The next minute, he's cursing him out saying, I know not the man. What was it about Peter? I'll tell you this. It said he responded. When Jesus rose from the dead and said, go call my disciples and Peter, Peter came. Peter was out of the will of God. Read John chapter number 21. He was out of the will of God. He said, I go a fishing. Now, I'm not saying you're out of God's will if you go fishing. But I'm saying if you're supposed to be soul winning and you say I'm quitting the ministry and going fishing, then you're out of the will of God. He said, I go a fishing. Nathaniel Thomas, James, John, you talk about a crowd of rough fellas. They make the deadliest catch look tame. They say, well, we're going with you, man. You got the boat? Yeah, I got the boat. Let's go get this thing. I don't know what kind of beverages were on that boat. I don't know what they were smoking on that boat, what they were eating on that boat, but there wasn't near none of them right with God. Not a one. The Bible says they fished all night and hadn't caught a thing. You hadn't met a more surly man than somebody who's been fishing all night and hadn't caught a thing. Say amen on that one. 
They're sitting there fishing and they look on the shore and old John, eagle-eyed John, looks down the road and says, I think that's the Lord. Now what did Jesus do? Jesus had got him some fish and Jesus, he, the Bible says he was cooking fish on there. Now we don't know how he was. I tend to think he might have been deep frying some of that Lebanese olive oil, amen. I don't know what he was doing, but he had fish and hush puppies, fish and bread, the Bible said, cooking them. John said, it's the Lord. Almost sign of kind of like, a, it's the Lord. What do we do? Peter never batted an eye. He didn't even wait for the boat to turn. The Bible says he jumped out of the water and swam to shore. I like that. It was one of those things like a dog chasing a car. What are you going to do if you catch the thing? Right? I don't actually know what Peter thought that he was going to do when he got there. But it shows something about the heart of Peter. Yes, Peter was out of the will of God. Yes, Peter wasn't right with God. Yes, there were some struggles. But deep down in his heart, I think God Almighty saw something that very few others did. God Almighty saw a man that would respond to him. And though he was at the bottom of the barrel, and though he was where he shouldn't have been, and though things weren't all, every T wasn't crossed and every I wasn't dotted, when Peter saw God, his heart responded. And I ask you this morning, is your heart responding to God? What is God wrestling with you about? Stop fighting him. Stop wrestling with him and respond to him, even in the shadow of failure. Lord, I may fail you. I'm going to respond. Oh, God, I'll respond. And that's what takes that Christian that goes from here to here and brings them here. And you begin to live a powerful, victorious Christian life. Why? You still got some failures, but you respond. You got some, got some hiccups, oh, but you respond. Amen. You still got that, but you respond. And you're walking with God. The pattern doesn't have to be here and here. It's not always going to be here. But you can live at a higher level than you are if you'll follow this message to its fullest conclusion. Yeah. Will you bow your heads for just a moment of prayer? So, on this Labor Day weekend, Here's what's, here's what's just going to happen. It's human nature. I could give an altar call and, and have you come up. I'm not sure how much that actually does. Because I don't think that you can settle in 30 seconds to two minutes something that's going to require some real heart searching. The challenge on the other side is, is that, well, I'm going to pray the music will sound, will be dismissed, and what will happen is you'll bump into a hundred other people between here and the car. You'll get in the car, and you'll be such a spiritual mood, and then your husband will say something stupid, or your wife will say something that you forgot to get milk, we don't have anything to eat. Your children will projectile vomit. Somebody will cut you off on the way home, and by the time you get home with all of the spiritual intentions that you have, gone. That's how most of it will be. But for that one that's here this morning that this message was for, for that two, for that remnant, will you go home? Will you find a place and say, Lord, maybe in the bathroom, shut the door. Maybe in your bedroom, get down beside your bed, kneel down. Maybe you need to go out on the back porch, or maybe you drop the family off and say, I'll be back in a minute, let me go for a ride. But find a place and say, Lord, that's my pattern, but I don't want to live that way. I want to take some of these truths, and, and, and I want to respond. Lord, help me. There's some things you've been working on in my life, and I'm failing galactically, but I'm going to respond the best I can. All God's looking for is a modicum of response from you. Real, heartfelt that says, Lord, you've spoken to my heart. I know what you're working on. I'm responding. And boy, if you'll do that, I promise you that roller coaster won't be near as steep 
and near as deep as it has been. Let's stand with heads bowed. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we dismiss in a word of prayer. I pray for the children of God this morning that you would feed them and strengthen them the word of God. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, <clears throat> that you would touch their heart and save them. That they not ride the roller coaster of this world, but they would stand on solid rock of faith in Christ. But for all of us as Christians, whatever you're dealing with us about, help us to respond. We all have that Peter pattern. We all have that struggle. But Lord, if we'll respond to you and trust you and walk with you, you'll help us to grow. Bless the message. Father, take us home safely and restfully. I pray you bring us back tonight, dear Heavenly Father, as we go out and pray. A little new, a little awkward, a little something we haven't done, but, but Father, that's, that's what Suncoast does. We do the normal different. So help us to go tonight praying, a praying people trusting in you and fellowship afterwards. Be with us. And Lord, thank you for your grace in the midst of our roller coaster. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Dismiss.